So to begin uh, the theory of computation, we need a notion of what it means for something to be computable. And uh, prior to the existence of uh, what were then called mechanical and eventually electronic computers that we're used to today, um, computer actually meant a person, usually a woman, who did calculations for the needs of, very frequently, the military. Um, and so there's a question of, if you want to reason about computation, you need a definition of what it means for something to be computable. And in the 1930s, uh, Gödel, Church, and Turing, and others gave many proposals uh, for what it meant for something to be computable. Um, and they started proving theorems about this. But it was really Turing uh, in 1936 who not only gave a proposal for what it means to be computable, but gave an argument for why this was the right definition. Uh, so in this segment, we're going to review Turing's argument and Turing's model of computation. Um, I should say at the outset, this model of computation influenced uh, von Neumann, who eventually you know, sort of led to the uh, creation of the modern computer, but essentially the, the point of the argument is that anything you can imagine as being computable in some sense is really captured by this definition. And prior to this definition, you know, what it, you know, now what compute means is compute on your laptop, right? But uh, we want a more abstract definition because when they were making this definition, they didn't have a laptop, they didn't have a desktop, they didn't have anything. It's, it's purely an abstract definition about the process of computation. So Turing's argument went like this. Say uh, you're trying to compute a number or maybe a function, right? I give you some number and you want to apply that function to some number. What do you do? Well, you typically are working with paper, although of course it doesn't matter that it's paper, right? It could be a blackboard, it could be nowadays your modern computer, but there's some place where you can record data. And Turing idealized this as a tape. Um, and actually in original uh, constructions of computers, it was fairly close to a tape. Uh, and he made it a one-dimensional tape just for simplicity because you want the simplest model that captures what you're talking about uh, so that it's easy to reason about. Right? Modern computers, of course, don't have a one-dimensional tape, but that's not really going to affect the notion of computation. So you have a one-dimensional tape that's divided up into squares or cells, and in each cell you can put a symbol, right? Maybe it's a digit like one or zero, or a letter like A or B. Um, but the key thing is that the, the individual cells of the tape are recognizable, right? You can tell where a cell begins and ends and that there are only finitely many symbols. Um, and there was a big argument about, oh, why should there only be finitely many symbols? You know, that seems very restrictive. Well, yes and no, right? On the, one, on the one hand, sure, it's only finitely many. On the other hand, we only have a right using finitely many symbols, right? You use uh, maybe a handful of alphabets from different languages and some digits, uh, but it's a finite list of symbols. And if you needed more, you make compound symbols, right? So maybe you would say like, oh, this, although it's built up of two symbols, I'm going to treat that as a single symbol. Right? So out of a finite list of symbols, you can get really as large a list of symbols as you want. Okay, so uh, you're writing on your paper or your computer or whatever, which we've idealized as a tape. You write down finitely many symbols. And then Turing makes this argument about, you know, well, what is it that you're doing? You know, you're doing some automated process, so you have some sequence of steps in mind. Um, there are only finitely many steps, and you may repeat them a lot. In fact, you, you might even be doing a process that leads you to repeat them infinitely many times, but there are only finitely many kinds of steps you can do, right? You can't keep in mind uh, a sequence of instructions that has infinitely many instructions that changes all the time, right? You'd have to be reading it from somewhere. Uh, and those instructions might be written on a tape, but we'll come back to that. Um, so you have a tape which uh, we, we imagine is as large as you want, okay? And the mathematical abstraction of that is infinite, right? But it's not so crucial, it's just as large as you want. If you need more hard drive space, you plug in an external hard drive, right? Um, it has finite symbols, and you, the computer in this case, uh, has a finite list of instructions that you're gonna follow. And um, the way he modeled this is uh, there's the controller, 
which itself has finitely many states that it can be in, where those states roughly correspond to uh, the list of instructions that you're going to follow. And this, what do the states do? The states tell it what to do next. So what does it do? Well, it looks at some particular square uh, on the tape, and based on what's in that square and whatever state it's currently in, uh, it decides what to do next. Maybe it uh, rewrites this square. So maybe it says, you know, its current instruction, it sees an A, it's supposed to turn it into a C. That could be part of a computation. Um, maybe it decides, well, given what's in this square, I actually need to look at the next square over, right? So instead of being here, it's now going to look at this square. Um, or maybe it says I'm going to do one of those things, but also I'm going to move to the next instruction, right? So I've changed my internal state of mind. Um, and this is essentially it. This is Turing's model of a computer, which we now call a Turing machine. Uh, and the argument that Turing made is that this essentially captures everything that you would naturally call computable by finite means. Okay. And although there have been proposals for uh, models of computers that potentially go beyond this, they usually involve some sort of infinity, taking infinitely many steps in a finite amount of time, things like that. Um, they're not generally considered practical. There are some proposals uh, based on black holes and quantum mechanics and things like that, but again, not particularly practical. Um, even the proposals for quantum computers that we actually want to build, when you talk about computing a function that takes in a finite list of symbols and spits out a finite list of symbols, uh, even those are no more powerful in terms of what they are able to compute than Turing machines. Um, and this argument that sort of anything you can think of can be simulated by a Turing machine, that was the kind of argument that Gödel and Church, uh, and even Turing, but in particular Gödel and Church were using before Turing came along. Turing came along and said, not only do I have this model that can simulate any model of computation that you think of, any reasonable sort of practical model of computation you think of, but here's an argument for why, right? And he explicitly says, this argument is an appeal to intuition. Right, to what we intuitively mean by something being computable by finite means, and therefore is necessarily mathematically unsatisfying. Um, so what's known as the Church-Turing thesis, which uh, in some sense um, was much more strongly argued by Turing, is that any model of computation can be simulated by a Turing machine. Um, and therefore that anything that you count as computable is computable by a Turing machine. And there's also what's called the physical church Turing thesis where you change this into not just anything that's computable abstractly, but computable by a you know, machine of finite means in the physical world. But again, all of these things, although they have a fancy sounding, official sounding name, they're really just an uh, appeal to intuition to what we mean for something to be computable. Now, I should say that this model of computation is specifically for uh, the setting where you have a discrete set of inputs, like numbers or strings of symbols, and a specific function that you want to apply to them. So uh, if you have that, right, say you want to compute the function, I don't know, f of x equals x squared, and I give you some number like, you know, x equals 123. So this fits into this framework. Um, and you could imagine, oh, you know, maybe I can get something more powerful than this by using randomness somehow, right? Where's the randomness in this going to come from? Well, you technically would have to augment this with a new kind of instruction that says something like flip a coin and write the output, you know, in the current tape cell. But it turns out that if what you're computing is a deterministic function of discrete inputs and outputs like this, um, that randomness can actually be simulated by a traditional Turing machine without randomness. Basically by trying all possible coin flips and seeing what the most likely outcome is. However, there are other situations such as in distributed or mobile computing where, say, uh, you want computers to randomly pick a unique ID, right? So that uh, every computer in the network has its own ID, it was chosen on the fly, randomly and no two of them have the same ID, there you might actually need a source of randomness, right? Because your goal there is not a function of discrete inputs and outputs, 
It's sort of, it's a function of time. There are many possible valid outputs and you just want them to have some property, but you don't really care which computer gets which ID in this scenario. Um, and for things like that, you may actually need randomness, but it's easy enough to augment this, as I said before, with just an extra instruction that says flip a coin, right? And then that's your model of computation. Uh, I should say this model is very nice. It's very clean, it's very simple. Uh, you can view it as sort of a simple, primitive programming language, right? In which you can write, in principle, any program you want. In practice, this programming language is horrible to use, and so we'll very rarely actually use it. But the point is, we want to know that there's a firm, uh, concise theoretical model underlying everything we talk about in the theory of computation.